Have you heard anything of what I said, or should I start all over again? Start from the beginning. Start from the beginning. Okay. Okay, I will do that. Thank you. So, um, again, thank you very much for your very kind introduction, and also please pass my regards to um, to the Vice Chancellor, Honorable Vice Chancellor, to the Additional Director, to uh, Principal Dr. Sarkar, and special thanks to you, ma'am, for inviting me. Uh, can I double check? Everybody can hear me? Sir, we can hear you. Fantastic. So, if at any point you can't hear me, please uh, interrupt. Thank you. So um, thank you for uh, asking me to speak on the coronavirus in the mind. Um, and I will do that, but I will break my talk into three parts. The first one is to just give you some medical background on uh, the coronavirus. Um, I will not bore you with too much of technical details. I'm sure everyone is very educated. And then I'll speak on the topic at hand, which is coronavirus in the mind. And it again is a binary topic. Because uh, coronavirus can affect the brain and the nervous system and also the mind, which is a psychological aspect of the coronavirus. So please uh, have a look at this uh, slide where you see the, uh, the uh, actual molecular structure of the coronavirus, uh, a photograph which has become very popular on the Internet. So here is the dreaded virus which has been troubling humanity for the last six months or more, uh, where it has uh, um, a central RNA, the ribonucleic acid, um, and this is why it's called an RNA virus. And on the outer aspect of this are these bikes. So, Dr. Madan, so, yes. I'm not able to uh, see your presentation. Really? Okay. Um, I was sharing my slide. Kind of uh, uh, present now. No? Yeah. Right. Okay. Are you able to see the presentation now? No, sir. No. Okay. Just give me a second. Is that better? No. Well, my window is being shared. Yeah, yeah, sir. Can you see? Yes, sir. Is it better? Yes, sir, yes, sir. Continue, sir. Yes. Okay, okay, that's fine. So let's start again. Um, I'm going to speak on uh, the SARS uh, coronavirus. Uh, firstly, I'll start with the molecular structure and the biology, but not bore you too much on the technical details. And then we'll talk about the coronavirus and its effect on the mind, which is a binary topic. It affects the uh, organic, that means the central nervous system and the brain, and it also has an effect on the psychological aspects. So we'll discuss that. Uh, this is the uh, molecular structure of the coronavirus, so the virus which has uh, uh, been um, uh, you know, disturbing all humanity for the last six months or so. And this is called the RNA virus because the body of this virus is made of RNA, the genetic material. On the surface are these tiny little spikes, um, which is what it uses to bind to the host. We all know that the RNA SARS virus, um, uh, the coronavirus, or SARS-CoV-2, as it is also known as, um, spreads by three different methods. The most common method is the droplet spread. The next one is the spread in the aerosol. And then the last one is the fomite. So let me just explain you what a droplet means. So when you're sneezing, coughing, talking, breathing, you are releasing droplets uh, which contain the viruses. So a sneeze can have 40,000 droplets, whereas talking will have something like 600 droplets. And this is the reason why all the governments around the world are asking us to cover our faces when we're sneezing or coughing and to wear masks. Aerosol means uh, the respirable particles are in the air. So if you're in a closed room with somebody has, uh, who has coronavirus, it's, even if you're standing two meters away from them, uh, you would be likely to contract that virus. And thirdly, the fomites means uh, the structures of the substances which have come in contact with the virus. Say, for example, uh, a glass uh, table or uh, a metal uh, shield or something like that, uh, you can still get uh, the virus if you touch it and uh, inhale it. 
Infection from the virus occurs by the spikes of the virus ad uh, adhering to the, um, the respiratory system and the, the, uh, the structure that it adheres to is called the ACE, ACE uh, receptor. This is very uh, widely present in the lungs and this is why this is a respiratory virus. This is a very clever virus. When it comes into contact with the cells, it will go inside the cells and make the cells produce its own RNA. And this is how it replicates or reproduces and infects. So what are the symptoms of this condition? Most common symptom would be a high temperature. The second common symptom is dry cough. Okay. So are you able to see it now, yeah? Yes, sir. Fantastic. Okay. So I was, I was speaking about the symptoms of um, the COVID-19 infection, also known as coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2. The most common symptoms are fever and then the dry cough. But then there's a plethora of symptoms which include joint and muscle aches, like when you get in any flu um, or viral illness. And another symptom which is very popularly been broadcast these days is uh, effect on the sm loss of smell and taste. So what happens to patients who get infected? So uh, thankfully, majority of the patients have very mild symptoms, whereas um, if you pro progress uh, in a, in a um, detrimental fashion, then you will have severe symptoms, which will be seen in about 12 to 14 percent of the patients. A proportion of that, about 6 percent, will have critical illness requiring hospitalization. And finally, uh, the dreaded symptom, uh, or in fact, the death, the last uh, resort, is uh, seen in 1.4 to 5 percent, depends on the um, registry you look at. So who is at risk of developing um, coronavirus infection? If you are immune suppressed, and immune suppression means your immunity is not working appropriately, and this can be because of conditions or diseases, or if you're on certain medications which lower your immune system, you can be having chemotherapy for cancer. Um, if you have chronic severe lung disease like asthma or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, if you have heart condition, pregnancy, and we have seen a lot in the UK uh, people who are obese, uh, who are more than 30 BMI, and patients um, who are of Asian or black uh, uh, ethnicity. The governments are telling you to prevent this virus because there is no cure yet. So you should do what you can to prevent yourself from contracting the infection in the first place. Because there is a lot uh, being advertised and posted on the social media about hydroxychloroquine. But I can tell you one thing, it does not work. Antivirals, none except for rest, um, Remdesivir, which is just, uh, as you know, has been bought over by the United States. There are no immune boosters, no matter what your friends, families tell you, no immune boosters can protect you from this condition. As we know, there is no vaccine yet, but the University of Oxford is working very hard. And dexamethasone can work, but it works in a hospital setting if somebody is really very unwell. Now coming to the topic of interest for you would be the coronavirus in the mind. And I say the organic. Organic means it's affecting the organ. The organ of the mind is the brain and the central nervous system. So I refer to uh, the recent um, uh, publication in Lancet uh, Psychiatry, published only on the 18th of May. These are all the symptoms that can affect uh, uh, patients who are infected with coronavirus. So when you see a patient being admitted in the hospital, the first symptom would be confusion or agitation. They may have altered consciousness. And uh, one of the symptoms which we have been investigating a lot is symptoms of stroke. So patients are admitted in the hospital whilst they're having the treatment, they have a stroke. A stroke is caused by two reasons. One, it can be caused by a blood clot in the brain or it can be caused by hemorrhage. What's happening in coronavirus infections is there is a lot of uh, evidence of blood clots because there's an altered clotting mechanism happening because of the severe infection. There's another study which um, looked at the neurological and neuropsychiatric complications of 153 patients only published last week on the 25th of uh, June. They found that the ischemic or um, the strokes which are caused by the blood clots and the hemorrhage and inflammation around the blood vessels in the brain, also known as vasculitis, were very common. Altered uh, mental status was unspecified encephalopathy and encephalitis. That means inflammation of the lining of the brain and of the tissue of the brain. 
Now we know uh, that the world went into a lockdown. This started in the United Kingdom on the 23rd of March when the confirmed number of cases were 958. Now, as you can see in the uh, diagram below, there are about 300,000. In India, lockdown followed a day later on the 24th of March with the confirmed cases only 500. But India has now got more than 500,000 cases or 5 lakh cases. What is scary, if you look at the trajectory of India, is on the uprise. So the number of cases are rising. So the worst is not yet over for India. Whereas in the United Kingdom, because of the lockdown, the number of cases are dropping. What we don't know is as the lockdown opens up, whether these cases will continue to drop or will rise again with the second spike. So the third aspect of my talk was on the mind, the psychology. Let me just tell you what are the factors at play and why psychology becomes such an important uh, uh, talking point now. So because of the lockdown, we've been asked to do social distancing, to self-isolate ourselves, to be shielding if you are a vulnerable group, like very old or have underlying, underlying health issues. People have been quarantined from their families and friends. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. And if that's the case, the markets uh, respond very adversely, giving you a financial meltdown. People have been working from home, so not seeing their colleagues or friends. There have been job losses, and believe you me, there will be more job losses in the next two, three months. This affects relationships. You see death all around you. There is so much junk in the social media, and there are so many fake treatments being brought about. Very much bad advice. Worry about your relatives, your friends, and there's a constant bombardment of negativity that's fired at us from all angles. So what's happened uh, to the mind per se? So a systematic analysis, a systematic uh, review and a meta-analysis of patients um, who were followed up uh, by this group of scientists, um, they felt that if the coronavirus follows the same pattern as it did for the SARS infection in 2002-2003, most patients will recover without any mental illnesses. However, there are three things which I would like to highlight. Number one is anxiety. Number two, depression. And the third one is the post-traumatic stress disorder. And I'll discuss these in turn. So what is worry or anxiety? Well, a little bit of worry and anxiety is not uh, bad for the human uh, mind because that makes you alert and that makes you keep prepared for any uh, misadventures. However, if you are feeling worried and anxious and fearful all the time or most of the time, and you're very irritable, that's affecting your emotions. There are certain physical signs you can see as well, like you're tensing your muscles, you're shaking, trembling, you may have uh, headaches, um, feeling of butterflies in your stomach, a shortness of breath, and often disturbed sleep. This can have an impact on your thoughts. So you're thinking that everything might go wrong and you're thinking about the worst outcome of every problem. And you're not just able to stop worrying. So this has an effect on your cognitive functioning. That means your problem solving analysis methods. You find it hard to concentrate. You can't read a book. You can't read a page. And this will also have an impact on your behavior. So you become restless and you're, not, you're unable to relax. And worries do not just affect the grown-ups, it also affects the youngsters. Most of you are teachers, you know that your college students have not been able to attend their colleges or university. So in a survey uh, undertaken by the Office of National Statistics in the UK, they found that 80% of the, patient, of the um, uh, youngsters said the main concern is that they are not able to attend the university uh, or the school or college. And they could not take their exams, so that's worry about that. The quality of education, no matter how good your internet-based learning is, the one-to-one -one which you get with your teachers cannot replace that. So how do you manage the anxiety and worry? Well, it's very useful to start with to recognize that you have a problem. So you may not understand that you have a problem, but you may have a friend or a colleague or a relative, somebody you're living with who may think that this is not right. So they give you an insight that you have been worrying unnecessarily. So you try and distract yourself. You focus your attention away from things. You try and undertake, and this is come again and again. You will try to do activities that occupy your thoughts 
So stay away from the social media. Try and relax. Do some physical exercises. And one very good thing about um, managing worry is to have a worry time. So spare half an hour a day for yourself where you can write down what you're worrying about. So the rest of uh, the 23 and a half hours, you're not worrying about those things. As with anything else, if nothing is helping, please seek professional help. Next comes depression. So what are the symptoms of depression? Uh, there are numerous symptoms, and I'm going to go through all of these. But you all know people who have been depressed, who feel sad and guilt uh, and upset, and they're hopeless, or they're very angry at things. So they have an effect on the emotions or feelings. Then, just like anxiety, you can have physical or bodily signs, such as being tired or exhausted, very restless, changes in sleep pattern, either sleeping too much or not being able to sleep, change in your appetite. When you're depressed, you can either eat a lot or you can have your appetite suppression. You can have poor memory and concentration. Depression has an effect on the thoughts as well. So you're always hoping, uh, there is, you've lost hope, there is hopelessness, you're thinking about the worst possible outcomes, you're losing your confidence, and then the most severe uh, effect of uh, depression is thoughts of death or suicidal ideation. Now, if that happens, do not try any home remedies, seek professional help. So is depression only caused by things which are surrounding you, your external factors? No, not necessarily. You can be genetically prone to depression. So you have a tendency to depression, or there can be triggers, such as in coronavirus situation, you may be living alone, so isolation, a close family member has died, so that's bereavement, you have a physical illness, or there are other problems or stresses in life. So coronavirus being coronavirus, it's not only that, life goes on as normal. So if you have money issues, if you have relationship issues, or if you have a condition that gives you considerable pain, and, and things that uh, uh, don't allow you to look after yourself as you used to prior to this problem. How do you manage depression? The first thing is to pick up the phone and to talk to your friends, your families, your colleagues, your well-wishers. Keep yourself engaged. Do something that will divert your mind. Find a new activity. Identify your negative thoughts. Try problem solving. Look after yourself. You have only one life. Who else will look after you? And don't resort to drugs or alcohol because it's very common. They may give you immediate comfort, but in the long term, they'll be causing a circle of depression. And as with anything else, please seek professional help, especially if you feel depressed enough to think about death. Lastly, I talk about traumatic stress. Traditionally, the post-traumatic stress disorder has been linked to um, soldiers returning back from war and having seen really bad scenes, but it can affect many, many, many different uh, aspects. If you're in a hospital for, um, uh, for an operation which went bad, you can have traumatic stress because of that. And this will present in many ways, such as you get flashbacks of that operation of the time in the hospital. You feel tearful. You find yourself unable to control your emotions. All these symptoms joined together give you a feeling of fear, anxiety. You feel that it's all your fault. So there's a sort of self-blame or guilt. You feel anger that not being able to control things and you feel ashamed that you've not been able to do so. So how do you manage this? Like everything else, Talk to others. Pick up the phone. Turn to your friends. Help yourself through activity. Try and do something new. Try and do something that you enjoy. Do something relaxing. It could be anything. It could be drawing, painting, writing. It could be yoga. Look, uh, set yourself realistic goals that can be achieved and consider alternative explanations for what has happened. Not everything is your fault and stop blaming yourself. Look after yourself. And like with anything else, if it doesn't get better, please seek professional help. So I've spoken to you so much about the doom and gloom, but is it all doom and gloom? Well, not necessarily. The UCL, uh, University College London, uh, did a study which was published last week. This did a study on uh, 
70,000 participants who've been uh, followed for the last 14 weeks since the lockdown, and they found that a third of people actually enjoyed the lockdown. So uh, I feel that I'm one of those uh, fortunate people who have enjoyed the lockdown. So who, who, are, who are these people who have enjoyed the lockdown? So number one would be adults who are aged 30 to 59, people who are living with others, who have higher household incomes, people who have no other previous mental health conditions, and those people are living with uh, children. So I fit the bill pretty much uh, in this group, and I really, really enjoy the lockdown because I did not understand the pace at I, uh, which I was working, working hard six days a week. This allowed me to rewind and uh, enjoy my life a bit more with my family. So what have you enjoyed in the last uh, few weeks of the lockdown? Most patients, as you look at this slide, they will say, I spend more quality time with the people I like and love. So I've been spending more time with my family, have a slower pace of life, You're not running around, not traveling a lot, keep in touch with friends and family, and make home improvements and so on and so forth. And I'm sure many of you will relate with the same. So the ONS, the Office of National Statistics, asked people about the lifestyle surveys. And look at this. I mean, this is very interesting. I find that if you are in an age group uh, which is 80 plus, you enjoy staying in touch with family and friends remotely the most. So if you have elderly parents like I do, ring them, speak with them. And if you are a youngster, what you would like to do mostly would be reading or gardening. So what is the future? Well, the future is uncertain. And I feel the psychological burden of COVID-19, it will become more evident as time goes on, as a lockdown opens up, you find what's happening to the financial markets. When you go back to work, will it be a new way of working? Will there be job losses? Uh, will there be uh, further deaths and, and further mortality from this? And my take home message would be, we need to look after ourselves and we need to look after each other. Find your ikigai. Ikigai means a reason for being. I'm not a sketch artist. I took up sketching first time in my life in the lockdown. And this is one of the sketches I made, the first one. So with that, I would like to thank you all very much for your patience and for listening to me. Thank you again for having me on board.